So I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Susan Wyndham Bannister. Dr. Wyndham Bannister was appointed by the Massachusetts Life Science Center Board of Directors to be the center's first CEO in May of 2008. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Wellesley College, a doctorate in Health Policy and Management from the Heller School at Brandeis University, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School. She completed her doctoral work under a fellowship from the Ford Foundation. Dr. Wyndham Bannister has over 35 years of consulting experience in life sciences and has worked with companies that represent all major industry sectors. As CEO of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, she is leading the implementation of Massachusetts' 10-year, $1 billion life sciences initiative. And we're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And I'll let you get started. Let me just clip myself up here. Can everyone hear me? All right. Uh, thank you very, very much for this invitation. I'm really, really glad to be here. I know that you have copies of my presentation. Um, and I'm going to go through my slides. <clears throat> I will focus on some. Some have a fair amount of detail. So I may highlight certain points. And again, uh, you've got copies there. I'd like to start um, with the big picture. I'd like to tell you a bit about the Life Sciences Initiative. What is it? Uh, what are our goals? And how are we going about our work at the Life Sciences Center? And then I'm going to talk more specifically about work that we are funding that I believe will be of interest to you. And uh, we'll end with some questions and some discussion among ourselves. When Governor Patrick uh, came to office, he had a vision that the life sciences cluster in Massachusetts really was uh, something that was very important and not just needed to be preserved, but that there needed to be significant investment uh, to enable it to grow and thrive and continue to make all of its contributions to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Those contributions, as you see here, um, obviously are to bring treatments, therapies, and what we really hope, cures, uh, put them in the hands of caregivers and into the bodies of patients, but also recognizing that the life sciences cluster is a very important economic engine for the Commonwealth. We look at life sciences in its broadest sense. So we're really talking about our academic medical centers, our universities, our very talented workforce, and our industries. And industries in biotechnology, in pharmaceuticals, in medical devices, in medical diagnostics, and in bioinformatics. So a, a very far-reaching, uh, broadly focused initiative. Uh, reflecting that, uh, the initiative is being um, stewarded by the Life Sciences Center. We are a quasi-public agency, which means that we are somewhat insulated from uh, a, a lot of political agendas, if you will. But at the same time, it means that we are responsible and we are harnessed to the, this overall mission that has been given to us by the state. Reflecting our broad mission, you see our board of directors uh, here. I report to that board. And you see that our board is really comprised of members of the larger life sciences cluster. So we have members of the governor's cabinet on the board. We have uh, Josh Boger from Vertex. We have an entrepreneur, Lydia Villacomaroff. We have Peter Slavin, who is the president of Mass General Hospital, and Mark Beer, who formerly was the CEO of Viacel. So very, very diverse board of directors. I think more importantly, all of the investments that we're making at the center are reviewed and vetted by a blue ribbon group of scientists. They represent industry. They represent academia. They represent the medical centers. The members of our scientific advisory board highlighted on the slide in orange come from the venture capital community which means that they are used to looking at good business because our goal at the center is to promote good science 
and good business. Now, why do I say that? Uh, we talk a lot about innovation, and obviously, uh, many of you are looking for innovation in the area of treatments and cures for spinal cord injury. I distinguish between invention and innovation. Innovation is great research, uh, it's interesting new findings, but innovation is really the dissemination and the putting into practice of those inventions, of those good ideas, of those new technologies. And that's what we at the center really care about. So we're not just looking for good, promising science. We're looking to turn that science into uh, technologies that are commercialized. They're in the marketplace. They are available for use. And we felt that having a scientific advisory board with the skills to not just look at good science, but how that science, is that science capable? Is it promising? Can it be commercialized? Was very, very, a very, very important part of our mission. I'm going to go through this very quickly, but we had a number of priorities in terms of where we invested this past year. And they were driven by my point about innovation. When you look at how good research gets translated into treatments and therapies and cures, there are a number of points where investment is important. Obviously, one is we need to support the academic institutions where the discovery is taking place. They're very, very important partners along this path to market. However, we also want to support the new companies that are bringing these technologies to the marketplace. We need to make sure that we have a talented workforce in Massachusetts. When I talk to companies that choose to come here, or scientists who choose to come here and do promising research, one of the first things that they talk about is the fact that we in Massachusetts have an incredibly talented workforce. And that, that includes skilled machinists, it includes experts in IT, uh, it includes skilled administrators, um, as well as scientists. We want to make sure that that talented workforce continues to be produced in great numbers here in Massachusetts, and we want to make sure that it is well distributed across the Commonwealth, so that wherever uh, a company may want to locate in Massachusetts to enable it to grow here, I can find what it needs in different parts of the state. Related to that are our investments in infrastructure. Life sciences needs a, a rather unique, and as you know, a cutting edge infrastructure to support it. It needs the latest in lab equipment and technology. It needs great IT support. Biomanufacturing companies need clean water and good wastewater management. We at the center want to make sure that we're using some of our dollars to support infrastructure around the state, especially at a time when the state's budget is very tight and aid to cities and towns is limited aid to our public institutions is limited. We at the center have some dollars that we can make available. And then finally, we want to attract companies to Massachusetts. We want them to stay here. We want them to grow and continue their innovative work. A few things about how we have chosen to invest our dollars at the center. We have really looked to close gaps in this path to market. Again, it's very important to us to get this good science into the marketplace so that it can be used, so that it can be administered, it can be given to, to patients. So we've taken a very close look at where the gaps are, especially in availability of dollars that tend to present significant roadblocks in that path from good science to commercialized products and therapies. And we are trying to fill some of those gaps. So where we feel a lot of investment has already been made, that's great. We're looking for those areas that are very important and there is not enough investment being made. We're looking to see where our dollars can make an impact. Our goal is to seed good ideas, to accelerate their growth, 
and to use our dollars to attract additional dollars. In terms of carrying our message to the legislature, we have focused on three metrics, job creation, leverage, and but for. What is it that would not be getting done without the investments of the Life Sciences Center? So without this initiative, because as you can imagine, we certainly are getting buffeted along with many, many state investments in this tough economy. Here is how the initiative is structured. It's a 10-year initiative, and it's a billion dollars of investment. I truly wish that meant that I had a billion dollars in cash sitting in a bank somewhere in Massachusetts, and my job was to go around the state with a checkbook and write checks for good opportunities. But in reality, this is how the initiative is structured. Half of the initiative is really targeted towards infrastructure, and that is through our capital fund. These dollars come from the sale of bonds, and the dollars are targeted to, as I said, a capital projects. You, you hear the term shovel-ready projects very often. We're looking for lab infrastructure improvements, lab build-outs, the building of new research facilities um, that are all supporting promising research with high potential to be translated into treatments and therapies and cures. Um, the second tranche of our fund, this is the, the blue side of the triangle, is tax incentives. The Life Sciences Center is authorized to award up to $25 million each year for the 10 years of this initiative uh, to companies to encourage them to further invest um, conduct research here in Massachusetts and create jobs in Massachusetts. And several of our tax uh, incentives are focused specifically on life sciences companies. So life sciences companies can get tax credits for clinical trials that they're running here in Massachusetts, for example. The third uh, leg of the triangle is an appropriation each year from the legislature. It is envisioned by the life sciences statute to be $25 million a year. Now, here's the reality of what our fiscal situation has been at the center since we were created uh, in June of 2008. Our, our capital dollars, a bit of a hum, let's see if I can fix that. Our capital dollars in FY09, which uh, as you know for the state ends on July the 30th, of uh, June the 30th. Um, our first year we received about $15 million. So certainly well short of the $50 million which we might have expected to get if we were taking $500 million and dividing it over 10 years. This year we are receiving $30 million. Again, this is our share from the sale of bonds. And I'll tell you in just a minute how we've been spending those dollars. We awarded in December, $25 million of tax incentives to 28 companies across the Commonwealth. I'll tell you which companies received, and two of them were very much in the space where they are looking at neurological and spinal cord injuries. Um, we will, as far as we know, be able to also award $25 million this year. Last year, certainly we, like so many programs at the state level, were affected by the budget cuts. Instead of receiving 15 million, of $25 million, we received 15. And this year, we received 10. Uh, but I'll tell you, we were happy to get the 10. Given the cuts and the challenges and the competition with many, many very, very important programs, uh, we were very pleased that the legislature saw fit to continue to fund the center. Now let me start with the bottom line, and then I'll tell you a bit about how we have spent the money. The bottom line is that uh, we have invested to date almost $181 million in three different types of projects, grants to academic organizations and medical centers, capital projects around the state, and life sciences companies. 
What's important is that we have served as a magnet for capital interested in investing in life sciences. Uh, as we all know, dollars are tight right now, but life sciences remains a good place for investors to put their money. They're risk averse. What we can do as a quasi-public agency is by investing our dollars, we can make some of these investments less risky, and it encourages other investors to come and co-invest with us. So what you can see is that we used our $180 million of public dollars. We turned it into another $680 million. So we used our collective public tax dollars to create a fund of over $800 million being invested in life sciences here in Massachusetts. In addition, our projects are creating over 6,000 jobs. Uh, and as we go to the legislature again and we make the case to why it's important to stay the course with this initiative, we're able to make three points. One is this is important. It's important to bring therapies and treatments and cures to the public who need them. Secondly, we can use these dollars to attract more dollars. And third, we create jobs. And we're creating jobs not just for scientists across the Commonwealth, but jobs in IT, jobs for skilled machinists, jobs in administration. We are very committed at the center to providing support for research and commercialized products that are responding to spinal cord injuries. I know that you know very well that this state is a focal point for research discovery and development that will one day mitigate the impact of spinal cord injury. Uh, I, I'm sure you're very familiar with the talented research, researchers that are working here. I think you know uh, a lot of work is going on here in the area of stem cell research and um, pluripotent cells, stem cell research. We have a very strong cluster in regenerative medicine. Our institutes for neurodegenerative disorders are world renowned and we are committed to financially supporting these organizations and to bringing them together in a well-organized, well-networked, and highly collaborative way that we believe is going to accelerate the work that they're doing and get some of that work into the marketplace more quickly. So let's talk about some of the investments that we've made. One of our first investments, and these are using our bonding dollars, so these are infrastructure projects, was in the Marine Biological Laboratory, which is one of our, believe it or not, leading institutions in the state in regenerative medicine. The real question, why can certain marine animals regenerate themselves? What can we learn about the regenerative properties of cells from marine animals. Um, this is a real hub for this work in the state and we invested ten million dollars in the new build out, the complete rebuilding and upgrading of one of the major labs at the Marine Biological Laboratory. As a result of our ten million dollar investment they were able to get another grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for $15 million, and they have recently won two NIH grants based on the fact that they can now talk about this newly uh, renovated laboratory. So a lot of very, very important regenerative work being done at the Marine Biological Laboratory uh, using our investment. Our largest grant to date is for the building of the Albert Sherman Center at UMass Medical School. This is going to be a $400 million project. Uh, we are very proud that we are funding $90 million of it. This is going to be the hub at UMass Medical School for quite a bit of their advanced therapeutics. So stem cell research, regenerative medicine, 
um, RNAi research. A lot of this is going to be housed at the Sherman Center. You're going to see a trend here of me in high heels and suits, shoveling, knocking down walls, wearing hard hats, etc. The tax incentive program, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this except to say that we have nine different tax incentives that we can make available. Eighty-four companies applied. That's a great, great statement. It says that while many companies in the Commonwealth are struggling right now, companies in life sciences continue to grow and invest uh, at a level where it makes sense to give them some kind of tax relief or, or tax incentives. Two of the companies that received awards from us or tax incentives are focused on spinal cord research. One is Neurometrics. This is a Waltham-based company. It provides products for preservation and restoration of nerve and spinal cord function as well as pain control. We gave them a tax incentive of about $300,000. They're creating 10 new jobs in the coming year, but more importantly, um, this incentive is going to continue to enable them to invest uh, heavily in their work and their products. Another company that received tax incentives from the center that is in the spinal cord research area is Facet Solutions. They're based in Hopkinton. They develop treatments for lumbar spinal stenosis and degenerative spinal diseases. Um, they also received a tax incentive of $300,000. One of our very important programs uh, was our accelerator program. I mentioned to you that we're very, very committed to supporting young companies that are bringing new technologies to market. We gave them loans that have enabled them to continue with their proof of concept work to get more data points, to get to the point where they're ready to go into human trials. And we funded seven companies. We invested $3.4 million in these companies. One of the seven, in vivo Therapeutics, which is based in Cambridge, is developing a technology to treat traumatic spinal cord injuries. Frank Reynolds um, himself, a victim of a uh, spinal cord injury is the CEO of this company. And through a lot of support that we've given to Invivo in terms of getting them a lot of media exposure and attention, Frank is going to be the cover story on the February issue of Inc. Magazine. Our sincere hope is that this will bring great attention to the, his work, to the work of Invivo, and obviously other investment. Invivo is making great progress. In December, they filed an, uh, an investigational device exemption application with the FDA requesting permission to advance to human clinical studies. So it is our sincere hope that um, sometime this year, in vivo is going to move out of its primate studies, they're in their third round of primate studies, and into human trials. Very, very excited about this work. Uh, we have a few other companies in our portfolio that are doing very well as well with FDA approval, but I wanted in particular to bring in vivo uh, to your attention. One of the ways in which we are adding to the pool of dollars that we have from the state is by partnering with other investors that are interested in the areas in which we at the center are investing. We've uh, developed what we call a consortium program. Disease institutes, foundations, VCs, angel investors, and corporate investors can come and co-invest with the center. The first company to join our consortium program was Johnson & Johnson. They gifted $500,000 to the center, which we were able to use to fund one of our uh, promising young companies. Johnson & Johnson has a great interest in the area of spinal cord research. Um, and so they will continue to partner with us this year. We have a number of other companies as well that are coming into the consortium. And as we're going out and talking about the areas in which we are very interested, we're looking for 
uh, companies, foundations, institutes um, that are also interested in these areas so that we can pull our dollars to accelerate the work that is going on. And this whole area of neuro and neurodegenerative medicine um, is an area where we are definitely pulling together a whole round table which includes researchers, investors, uh, and companies. Another company that in which we've invested is, is Organogenesis. This also is a company in the regenerative medicine space. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just to say that this whole issue of promising companies and regenerative medicine is of great interest to us. So let me talk a little bit now about the research that we're funding. So I've talked about some of the infrastructure that we're funding. I've talked about companies that we're funding. Let me talk a little bit about the research that we're funding. We have given three rounds of grants over the past year. We have invested just under $13 million. We have matched every one of our dollars one to one. So we've invested $25 million in research uh, just in this past year. We gave research grants to 21 young scientists around the Commonwealth that are engaged in promising translational research. So not just interesting science, but research that has the promise uh, to come to market, to really become a viable treatment uh, or a therapy. Um, we have given money to fund faculty positions, and we have also funded six collaborations between companies and academic institutions. Um, a very fast way to promote the transfer of a new technology out of a, an academic setting and into the marketplace is if a company spots this technology and finds it promising and wants to invest money in it. What we can do at the center is to support the companies by matching their investment. So for example, these are six partnerships that we have funded. One of them is between Boston Scientific and UMass Lowell. They're looking at novel polymer biomaterials many of which would become devices that would be used in treating spinal cord injuries. We've invested about $200,000 and we're going to invest that for three years. So we'll be investing $600,000. Uh, Boston Scientific is investing as well, $600,000. So $1.2 million of investment in these novel biomaterials. I mentioned as well that we have uh, invested in faculty positions. You can see some of the areas here, biomanufacturing, science, and engineering, obviously an area um, that we know is very, very important to research in spinal cord injury. We've put about $3.5 million to enable our academic medical centers and universities to hire senior faculty. We have also funded, uh, as I said, 21 young investigators. They're listed in your materials, uh, so I won't go through all of these slides. I just want to point out a few of them that are doing research that bears directly on spinal cord injury. Laurie Boyer at MIT um, is really focused on some stem cell research and how um, cells differentiate and can be turned on you know, to address various types of conditions or turn themselves into pluripotent cells. And again, you can see um, a variety of work here, how cells respond to stress. There are a number of areas that we have funded that bring to bear directly on spinal cord injury. I wanted to say as well, we have invested over $8 million in a stem cell bank and registry at UMass Medical School. We thought, given the promise of spinal cord injury research that is tied to stem cells, that it was imp important for us to have a resource right here in the Commonwealth. Uh, we have some great institutes here, as you know, at MGH, at Harvard, 
uh, but we really wanted the state to have a stem cell bank. This is an embryonic stem cell bank. The registry is an online resource for researchers not just around the Commonwealth and not just around the country but around the world to come and take a look at work that is being done. We continue to support this and under the Obama administration's decision to lift federal restrictions on embryonic stem cell research funded by NIH, we have put the state, we believe, in a very, very good position to compete even more strongly for NIH dollars. I mentioned that we also care quite a lot about the next generation of workers in life sciences. One of the things that we hear from companies is that they need workers who know their way around the lab. It's uh, great to have uh, a degree, but we need people who know how to navigate a lab. So this past year, we invested $500,000 in an internship program, which enabled students from all around Massachusetts uh, to place their resumes on our website. 500 students put their resumes there. Companies could go and shop our website, a speed dating service, if you will, uh, and find students from all around the Commonwealth with interest in life sciences, with good backgrounds that matched their needs. We placed 104 interns at 59 life sciences companies, a third of our interns uh, who were eligible for full-time jobs because they were graduates uh, were offered positions. So we're feeling very good about putting employers and prospective workers together. We're funding this program again. This year we are expanding it somewhat. Uh, both in terms of the dollar amount invested, it will be $750,000 this year. We are going to include graduate students uh, as well as, as undergrads and recent grads from undergraduate programs. And we're making a special effort to make these interns available to smaller companies who are often doing a lot of good cutting edge research but are not able to find or hire interns. Another thing that we've been very successful in doing is attracting companies to come to Massachusetts. Uh, many of them choosing to locate in Massachusetts from overseas and to start their uh, headquarters in the U.S. here in Massachusetts. And uh, one company that you might find of interest is BioCell Center. This is an Italian amniotic stem cell company. They are a, a, a bank for stem cells, but are also looking, again, at innovative applications for stem cells. We have been very pleased to host their ribbon cutting here uh, in, in Medford, which is where they opened their headquarters in the U.S., but also to make sure that they're being well plugged in to the stem cell community here in Massachusetts. Another company, Sci2 Cell Architects, is another company that we believe um, is doing some very promising work that could have a direct bearing on spinal cord injury. We welcomed them here in December and again are making sure that they are very well integrated into our research and business community here in Massachusetts. So um, this ends my formal co comments. I want to make sure that there's time for questions and discussion. Um, I invite you to do one of two things. Please uh, keep up on what we're doing. You can visit our website. There are lots and lots of materials there on our programs and the work that we're doing. We have news updates. Uh, we also, every Friday, post an event bulletin, things that are going on around the state in the area of life sciences. I'd be more than happy if any of you have cards or would like to give me your email address. I'll make sure that you get into our email list. We have 800, 1,800 people in that email list. You will proactively receive our newsletter. You'll proactively receive information on the programs that we're funding. Uh, it's a good way to keep track of what we're doing. Shortly after I took this position um, as the CEO of the Life Sciences Center, uh, Dr. Eric Ruby was kind enough to invite me to speak at a spinal cord injury day up at the State House. I think I took 
my job in uh, July, and I'm going to guess in August perhaps or September, he extended the invitation. And I said at that time that spinal cord injury was a priority for the center, uh, that I would look forward to coming out regularly and giving you updates on what we are doing. Um, I hope you can see uh, in our portfolio there's a lot of work that's going on, some directly, but some in fields that we think will bring to bear great promise in the area of spinal cord injury. We're very excited about in vivo, the fact that they are looking to move into human trials um, this year. So uh, my only request in closing would be uh, please invite me to come out again later and let me give you an update on what we're doing. Uh, I invite you to hold us accountable for spending these dollars in a way that will be beneficial. My sincere hope is that uh, when next I come uh, to speak with you, um, there will be uh, less and less need for these kinds of events. They will be more talking about uh, injuries and conditions that were things of the past. Uh, but this is an area that we take very, very seriously. So again, I thank you for the invitation. I thank you for the chance to brief you on what we're doing. And I'm very happy to take your questions. Don't be shy. Not, not very well, but I will, I'll try my best and I'll repeat the question so everyone can. investing in a couple of, of, inter, of what I think very interesting uh, technologies that address chronic wounds. So one of the wound closure systems in which we are uh, investing is a, a system, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a gel that is injected into a wound. And interestingly enough, normally when we think of, of applying heat to something, it, would, it liquefies. In this case, the body temperature causes uh, this particular substance to really uh, congeal and become firm. So it seals a wound, uh, it stops bleeding to create a, a, a clean field for science, uh, for uh, surgery, uh, and uh, so it makes it very easy to do more surgery in the field, but we're especially interested in, in it as well as a way of closing and addressing chronic wounds. So that's how the technology works. Another company that you may have noticed, Cystogenics, is also in the field of, of, of chronic wound care management. So things like bed sores, um, ulcers that often diabetic patients will, will get. So we're very, this is a, a space in which we're very interested. And of course, Johnson & Johnson is a big area of interest to them. So we're really hoping that together we will invest in some of these interesting technologies. Thanks for asking. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, none of the products that we have supported, with the exception, obviously, of some of the work that's going on, let me just go back quickly to our two are companies that have received tax incentives. Both of these are up and going uh, companies with products in the marketplace, but they are still small companies. Our goal is to um, help them grow more quickly. 
Um, in vivo, obviously, is a company but has yet to enter its, its, uh, its human trials. So at the moment, our goal is to focus on newer technologies and newer companies and help accelerate their ability to get their products in the market and to partner with companies that are interested in the spinal cord injury space uh, to co-invest for that same objective. So at the moment, you know, rather than looking at companies that are up and going and have well-established approaches, we're looking for some of the newer companies that, that, that need money to advance their technologies. The question is, uh, the first question was, uh, have the companies in which we've invested already commercialized their products? And the, 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 the question now is, are there timelines? When we are looking at um, our applicants for the accelerator program, as an example, we are looking at technologies that have the potential to be commercialized in the relatively near future. That's very important to us. Uh, again, we're really not looking at basic research. We're not looking at entities that are a long way from commercializing their products. So as you could see, one, two of this, these companies that we funded have now gotten their FDA approval. One has signed a marketing agreement, and Vivo is ready to go into clinical trials. So when the scientific advisory board is, re and, and the, uh, is reviewing the applications for our funding, they are very much looking at what they think is the time to market and what they believe the impact of our investment will be in accelerating that. Yes, that's a very, it's not that we say it's got to be within a year or two years because we understand there's an FDA process, et cetera, but we are looking for uh, technologies that are right on the verge of being commercialized as opposed to years down the road. Thank you. Other questions? Um, the question was, how do I get involved in research? Um, most human trials, most clinical trials are going to be administered either through a panel of participating physicians who have patients that they feel will qualify or maybe hospital-based trials. So I would certainly um, express your interest and willingness. There are times when companies will simply go through the web or perhaps even in um, in, in the paper, looking for patients who may be interested and who may meet their criteria for a trial. But I think that the best way is to make sure that your, uh, that your physician or uh, that your physician knows that you might be interested in, in, in participating. Dr. Ruby, would you like to add anything to that? Any of your thoughts about that? How, how do you, what's the best way to get involved in clinical research? Should, should we, do you think we should let Steve answer, the, and then we'll come back to those questions? Yeah. So one of the things that I would say is that I would agree with uh, Dr. Linda Master that I believe it is important in terms of research to go to your physician. Because you want to make sure that you're participating in reputable research, and that you are not uh, participating in trials that are not FDA approved. I think that's really important in international research projects and 
for the, the information from the researcher in South America. And the information was written and written, and it essentially said very little information. And my very intelligent patient was considering participating. And the information that was written was essentially uh, patient will receive stem cell transplant, patient will have return of bladder function in one year, patient will have return of bowel function in two years, and patient will walk in three years. Please wire $15,000 to the following number, bank account. And my very intelligent patient was really considering participating. And I said, you know, we should do some research and find out if this person is respected in the scientific community. So I just caution you. I think that there are um, that there are lots of reputable research projects that are happening in the United States. Most of your physicians will know those things that are going on. You can go to websites like uh, our website, any of the model systems for spinal cord injury websites, the uh, Miami Project for the Cure has a great website regarding spinal cord injury research, but I just caution you to make sure that you're participating in reputable research and that you're not being taken. Any other questions coming over the web? In terms of our our investment in spinal cord injury. The, the question is, uh, is the focus on new injuries or chronic injuries? And I think if you take a look at our investments, you'll see that we are focusing in both of those areas. Some focused on um, acute injury, others on chronic injury. Certainly our stem cell research um, is, is focused on uh, being able to reverse some chronic injuries. So we, we really care about both. Uh, the question is, are we approaching companies or are they seeking us out? Um, and are we encouraging companies from outside Massachusetts to apply? We are, as we say, sourcing our applicants as broadly as possible. Um, we send out very, very extensive communities and solicitations for applications. We uh, contact the medical centers. We contact the universities. We would look to someone like Dr. Ruby uh, to bring companies to our attention. So we are, in many cases, inviting companies to apply. We also are very happy to have companies uh, with whom we haven't met apply. Uh, all companies stand a fair chance of being considered. Again, we're looking at the impact of their technology. It's being vetted by our scientists and by our business experts. And we're looking at how quickly we believe this technology can be brought to market and whether or not our investment will help accelerate doing so. We are willing to look at companies from outside Massachusetts, but they must have, they must have a presence here in the state. So there are a number of companies uh, that may have their headquarters outside of Massachusetts. They must demonstrate that they are a real company in Massachusetts and are making some investment in Massachusetts. That matters to us because we have an economic development responsibility as well as our responsibility to support um, good translational research and uh, companies that are really bringing that to market. But we are uh, first and foremost wanting to support what's going on here in Massachusetts. But we um, certainly recognize that there is work that's going on outside of Massachusetts. The California Institute for Regenerative Medicine has approached us about some possible collaboration between the uh, research that is going on in uh, California, but there may be parts of that research which could be done here in Massachusetts. We would fund the work in Massachusetts. They would fund the work being done in California. So it's very possible that if not this year, next year, we may actually be supporting collaborative initiatives that are not completely based here in Massachusetts. Are they lined up already for the? 
Um, Okay, I, I don't know if they are referring to in vivo therapeutics trials or if, if, if they're talking about our applications, um, we are going to be funding in 2010 with our board's approval um, several programs that are targeted at young companies. Um, two rounds of the accelerator program, this is the program that is supporting in vivo therapeutics. We will be, uh, with our board's approval, opening a round in February and another round in September. In addition, there are a number of very promising companies here in Massachusetts that have received federal dollars through NIH or NSF to support their technology. They now need money to, to commercialize, to grow. We are going to be offering matching grants to companies that have received already uh, what we call SBIR, these are Small Business Innovation and Research Grants. Uh, so they have very well vetted technology. They are now ready to go either into human trials or into manufacturing. We will be bringing that program to the board next week. And uh, the minute the board approves it, it will open up for applications. So we'll actually have three programs this year for young companies. Uh, we are hoping as well to fund another round of our cooperative research grants, which are the partnerships between companies and academic institutions. Um, regarding people being lined up for trials, if that was the question for in vivo, uh, I can't speak for Frank Reynolds. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, the question was what statistics are being gathered right now on spinal cord injuries and on the technologies which are the most promising. Um, as I said earlier, we at the Life Sciences Center have a relatively broad mandate. We are focused on a number of therapeutic areas, uh, not just spinal cord injury, uh, oncology, cardiology, um, diabetes, and the like. So it is not our mandate, uh, and we don't frankly have the resources to uh, serve as a um, source for compiling uh, data on spinal cord injury. We rely on the many experts around Massachusetts to provide us with that information. Uh, so uh, what we are looking at through our scientific advisory board, a, the scientists and the VCs on that scientific advisory board who are quite conversant in the most recent technologies and research is when applications are coming to the center, uh, I believe that they have a very good sense of, of how innovative that technology is and where the most promise is being shown. But we at the center are not compiling those statistics. Uh, again, we're not staffed or resourced to do that. Great. Great question. The question is, are we funding at all research on the effects of spinal cord injury on the body? And one of the reasons that I thought that you might be interested in seeing what we're funding in the area of wound care is absolutely many of, of these companies, and I think you saw that actually two of our accelerator companies are in the, in the wound care space, Cystogenics, another company that we have supported, which has just come here from the UK, is in the chronic wound care space, and exactly um, these are the areas in which they are most concerned. Um, I invite you, if you're not familiar with Cystogenics, please take a look at them, visit their website. A very, very interesting company. Uh, you may have seen that some of the, our young investigators are also exploring these issues. So yes, we're very aware of uh, the importance of doing work in the area of wound care, wound care management, chronic wound management, and this is an area of great interest to us, and I hope you'll see reflected in our portfolio uh, several investments in that area. Uh, again, I didn't get into great detail about some of these companies, but I think if you go to their websites and you look at where they're focused, uh, what their technologies are, you will see that many of them are absolutely focused on, on these areas. And one more
Does a diagnosis of depression eliminate one from being, I assume that uh, the question here has to do with participation in a trial. Uh, I am really not uh, qualified to answer that question. I don't know what the specifics will be for some of the human trials coming up and what the, re what the requirements will be for participants, but I think you got great advice from Steve and from, uh, from Dr. Ruby, from Eric, uh, about ways to explore that, either with your physician who would be aware of trials, going uh, on the website uh, for BMC, et cetera, and really looking to see what, what the, um, the criteria are for patients that are being selected into these trials. I'm sorry I don't have the answer to that question. Thank you. Any other questions before we, we wrap? I'll turn it back over. Thank you so Again, thank you, and I hope that uh, you'll invite me back to give you the next round of updates. We have more companies and research we'll be funding, and I look forward to coming back and tell you about, telling you about that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose Bannister. We would love to have you back. I thought it was a very interesting talk. And it's great to see that there are so many companies in Massachusetts who are working toward improving quality of life for patients with multiple uh, disease processes, and in particular, our interest spinal cord injury. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be in touch with you about our next lecture. Please remember to fill out your blue survey sheets, which will help us choose topics in the future that are of interest to you, and I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Please be safe going home, and we'll see you soon. Good night.